All right. So tonight we're going to talk about experimentation done by medicine and science, especially on humans. And this is a crucially important topic for, for a lot of different reasons. I mean, there's I'm going to talk about some things that probably most of y'all have run into or maybe you've heard about through documentaries or whatever else. They're, they're really infamous things that happen throughout history. Um, but I'm also going to give some lesser known examples. And I hope that what I'm kind of showing is that, you know, it's not just a mistake here or there, but there are many many mistakes that scientists and doctors do whenever they're conducting experimentation on humans. And this is why we think it's relevant for people to study medical ethics. These problems aren't resolved, you know, such that we just learn the lessons and never have to deal with them again. This is stuff that continually happens, all right? And I think that another motif of, of a lot of the studies is that medicine isn't just some sort of passive thing where you know it's inheriting racist stereotypes or whatever else it is to where it doesn't have to think about these things ableism you know uh, discriminating against people of different abilities right what we find whenever we study history and whenever we look at the history of the medical sciences and stuff like this is that basically medicine can be actively involved in permeating sexist, racist, transphobic, ableist ideas. Basically, medicine becomes an instrument of perpetuating really harmful ideas. And part of what I hope you're taking away from this class is trying to find apparatus, trying to find tools that you can use to critically assess what's going on. Right. Because if you go, I mean, this is this is mostly for people who work in hospitals. Right. But I know that I have a lot of pre-med nurses, those kinds of students in this class. If you work at a big hospital, you will likely have access to an ethics consultant team. Right. And if not an ethics consultant team, maybe you have something like chaplain services or, you know, something like that, that you can help out. If you go into private practice, maybe you have uh, certain legal services on retainer or you have, uh, you know, doctors that specialize in medicine. But even when you don't have those resources, hopefully, hopefully what this course is allowing you to do is to develop a bit of a conscience so that whenever certain stuff happens, you uh, the red flags start to be raised, right? You start to think about what's going on at least a little more critically or that's the hope, All right? Now, the, the sort of core thing that we're going to talk about here and the core principle of medical research is this idea of informed voluntary consent informed voluntary consent super super important okay and i want to break that down for a little bit but basically the core idea is that patients need to be free to make decisions okay so for so for this particular module we spent a lot of time reading um deidre cooper owen's book right medical bondage and it talks about, and, and, and we'll summarize a lot of these claims of it, uh, but it talks about the role of enslaved women, you know, uh, in the development of American gynecology, right? We assume that research participants or, you know, the research that we're getting is done by informed, cons informed voluntary partic uh, voluntarily participating people, but that's not always the case, Right. People need to be free to make decisions. People who are enslaved aren't free to refuse, right? So that's one of one of the core ideas that she talks about in her book. Um, but the other idea is, I mean, obviously, we should know that sl using slaves is wrong now. But we should also realize that we shouldn't coerce or pressure participants into studies. And one of the ways that we can kind of figure that out is you can always ask the question, can they refuse and not be worse off, right? So I think that a lot of times whenever we think about coercion, we can emphasize things like, you know, not blackmailing people, right? Uh, you know, not pressuring them in certain sorts of ways, yet, yet not doing the negative stuff, right? But one of the things that we saw, and this is like the Carl Elliott book where he talks about the, the guinea picking, the people who are professional 
participants in studies because they do it out of financial concerns, right? One of the things that we need to look at, even if we decide you know, not to forbid certain people from being in studies, is to make sure that the economic things, economic uh, exchange that people are getting or the rights that participants have, that it's okay, right? It's not putting people in worse off cases whenever they refuse to be in the study, right? And and I won't go into all of this because we, we talked about this with the Carl Elliott book, book, but whenever we're trying to decide whether someone is actually free and able to make the decision, it's not just whether legally they have the have the ability to make the decision, but ethically speaking, whenever we're, you know, putting them in a position to do the study, are we using their circumstances or any other pressure to sort of force them into the study? Because that should set off ethical red flags if we think that that is the case, right? This is also why Elliot emphasized we need to allow participants to seek um, medical care or to be provided medical care for any long-term side effects. That's not the case in America. We should probably also provide them salaries and economic stuff uh, that is commiserate with what they're actually doing, right? Not pretending like they just aren't going from study to study. So the point here is that if we want our, our patients or the participants to have voluntary consent, we need to actually make sure that the conditions that they're making decisions in are conditions where they can make free decisions, where they can, you know, uh, actually refuse, okay? But a precondition for a lot of that is that in order to make decisions, participants or patients, they need information. They need information, okay? And they can get this from scientists or doctors or whoever is basically orient them, orienting them and doing the intake procedures and, and talking about stuff. But one of the things that physicians or healthcare practitioners will often talk about is that there's a lot of pressure. So if you're an attending physician in a giant hospital, you might be in charge of hundreds of patients, right? But there's, there's a lot of pressure basically to get through things as quickly as possible, okay? And physicians feel as though they can't possibly spend the time or, or like, you know, diagnoses are really complicated, especially in a field like oncology, so cancer. You know, in, in something like orthopedics where you fractured your arm or whatever, that's pretty cut and dry. I mean, procedures can be kind of difficult, but you can explain that. You can even show a patient an x-ray or, or an MRI or something like that. You, you can see what's going on. But in other cases, not so much. But in order for patients to even be able to make an informed decision. You just have to spend the time with them, okay? This should probably be the physician, but if it's not the physician, then a nurse or a technician in certain cases can be, you know, informing patients on what's going on. They need to know stuff about their diagnosis. So what's going on in their body? What's the best guess or maybe the competing theories that are kind of going on? What's the prognosis? What does it look like is going to happen? What is the treatment uh, and then the treatment options. What does the treatment plan look like? Okay. Are there multiple treatments available? Um, are there different risks and benefits to each of the treatments? What are the economic considerations? What are the social considerations, etc.? But you just have to take the time to talk these things through or else you can't even get consent, right? You can't get consent. In the same way that we would, we would basically say that if you're coercing a person, if they can't refuse going into the study, that's not consent. Similarly, we would say if they don't have the proper information, they are not consenting, okay? And so we just need to take the time to explain all of that. And one you know, practical thing that I can also give is that look, consent and all of the information, all of the information, the aspect of consent, right? That can be done over multiple appointments. Okay, so especially in a stressful diagnosis, like a chronic disease, cancer would be a good one. If you're giving someone a diagnosis, that's going to be really stressful for them to take in that information, right? And if you are considering really complicated therapies, such as, you know, uh, transplants or, or whatever else it is, you're probably going to have to explain that, right? Or, or, or devices that aid the heart in pumping and how, how you do that versus organ transplantation. Sometimes these diagnoses are really scary. 
and you just have to sort of sympathize with the patient and and you can explain as much as you want but if they start to look overwhelmed and you see you can sort of see that in them just just offer to say hey look look uh i i know this is really overwhelming we can talk about this in another appointment etc right there are many physicians who will give out cell phone numbers or clinics will have you know information centers that you can call so that people can gather information bit by bit before they go into it. Why? If people aren't consenting, you're violating their autonomy, okay? You're violating their autonomy. One of the core principles of biomedical ethics that we set out at the beginning of the semester is autonomy. People able to make people being able to make decisions for themselves, right? That doesn't happen if they don't have the right information and if they aren't free to either accept or reject what's going on, right? And, and I glossed over this point, but a lot of times the healthcare workers and especially physicians will just assess the patients themselves and make sure that the patients are understanding what's going on, that they, are, are, they appreciate the risks and, and the burdens of, of or the risks and the benefits of the treatments or they understand the diagnoses, they understand the options, etc. Now there are sometimes liminal cases or gray area cases where if you're working in a hospital, you can call in a consult from psychiatry services or, or other types of services just to make sure that it seems like the patient is able to make decisions. Um, there's some gray area in certain cases, especially with, with children maybe, or, or people where you can't find any next of kin to make decisions. In those cases, you can appoint uh, guardians ad litem, so legal systems can, can appoint people to make decisions. But for the most part, healthcare workers or the physicians themselves are, are making sure that people do have the capacity to decide. And if they have capacity, you have to make sure that they are giving informed, voluntary consent, informed, voluntary consent, okay? So that's the main thing that's going to be violated here, all right? So whenever we talk about medical experimentation and violations of consent, one of the first things that people will talk about are the experiments done in Nazi Germany, especially in the death camps, and especially by the guy on the right here, Josef Mengele. Josef Mengele is, is, is the most diabolical and infamous person in, in the stuff that he did. Medical experimentations on sterilization, uh, basically doing stuff that amounted to torture. Uh, they were finding lots of ways to basically, uh, <laughs> to, to violate the human body, various ways to castrate people, various ways to kill people in order to help the genocide that the Nazis were committing against the Jews and against various other minorities, right? But it wasn't just Mengele. There were many other Nazi doctors, such as Karl Klauberg, Horst Schumann, and many others that were instrumental in this in various spots throughout Nazi Germany. Okay? So I think part of part of what I'm trying to emphasize in this particular lecture is that, you know, it's not just a few bad apples, right? It's more than that. There's a pattern here, right? And even in Nazi Germany, it wasn't just Josef Mengele. It wasn't just one camp. It was multiple things going on, right? It was multiple things going on. And we need to be aware of that. Additionally, I think one of the mistakes that we make whenever we're studying Nazi Germany is thinking, oh, that, that couldn't happen here, right? Uh, Americans, Americans wouldn't do this. But here's the thing. There was an American eugenics movement in the late 1800s, early 1900s, right? Um, in fact, the president of Harvard at the time, right, Charles William Eliot, he gave a speech on racial purity in 1912, okay? Harvard isn't some half-rate institution. These people aren't just, you know, misinformed, uh, passive people that are receiving propaganda. These are powerful people, these are educated people, and they're still putting forward really harmful ideas, okay? The picture is of uh, a man by the name of Charles Davenport who received his PhD from Harvard in 1892 and he was a professor at Harvard. He was also basically the leader of the American eugenics movement. Eugenics being trying to create uh, a, a master race or, or, or maintain racial purity or to try and keep some sort of racial hierarchy, right? And using science and technology to do that sort of thing, 
Charles Davenport was doing that, right? And it wasn't just happening at Harvard, right? There were many eugenics groups throughout the country at places like Yale and Columbia and Johns Hopkins and, and many places, right? Medicine is not passive in this. Medicine is very active or very often active in this. Science can be used to perpetuate really harmful ideas. So we should always be critical of the information that we're having. And one of the principles, justice, right? Justice is concerned about the distributing the benefits and the burdens of society fairly. It should be a huge warning sign to us if it's if we look at a medical practice. And it seems as though that the only people who can get the treatment or the only people who are benefiting from the research are the ruling class or the elite or the wealthy or a particular race. And the people who are bearing the risks or the burdens are a subjugated class or they're a minority or they, they're immigrants or whatever else it is. They're a vulnerable population. This stuff has happened so many times throughout history. And in fact, certain people have made the argument that Americans were the inspiration for the eugenics movement in Nazi Germany. Now, it's probably complicated. It was probably happening in multiple spots around the globe at that particular time, especially given uh, the the prominence of social Darwinism that was, that was raising in Great Britain. But there were many Americans that won high honors and cooperated with Nazi scientists, okay? Whenever we look at Nazi Germany in the past, in, in these medical experiments, we shouldn't be separating ourselves very far from that because we were cooperating with them and we were doing some things that they were taking inspiration from, right? This is, this is a case. This is a case, okay? Another thing that we don't often think of are these socially liberal countries as they exist today. And we don't think that stuff is continuing much into the future. So Nazi Germany, wow, that was so far. Uh, Sweden. Sweden had its own experiments where they were doing experiments on people with intellectual disabilities, right? And so these, these happened in, in Vipaholm um, at a care facility for those with intellectual disabilities. And, and they weren't entirely sure what the cause of tooth decay and cavities were. They had... A little bit of an inclination that it was something like candy because uh, people who were poor and therefore didn't have money for things like refined sugar or sweets, they seemed to have fewer dentistry problems as or fewer dentistry problems than those who did have a lot of uh, money for refined sugar and sweets and that kind of stuff. So they decided, let's test that out and let's test that on people with intellectual disabilities and let's just give them lots of candy and not encourage them to clean their teeth and just see what happens, okay? What happens is what we know happens now, right? But these experiments were continued on to pretty severe degrees. I mean, look look at the degree of tooth decay, right? Think about how intensely sensitive your teeth are as well. Like, this is a really harsh experiment and it happened in Sweden, right? But these things, again, happened in America. Okay, so so mental health is is something that's really complicated. Mental health, especially, you know, extreme or, or, or not just mental health, but neurological cases. So cases where you might have seizures, cases where you might have really violent fits and actually be a, uh, a danger to other people, right? There, there was not a lot that we knew about the brain at the beginning of the 1900s. And uh, we actually awarded Nobel Prizes to advances in, in neurobiology and neurology and that kind of stuff. And out of that came the work of Igas Moniz. So he was a, a famed neurologist or neuro, neuroscientist, right? And uh, Walter Freeman, who was a physician in America, took the work of Igas Moniz, who won the Nobel, and he developed what was called the trans, transorbital leucotomy or common parlance you might hear about this the ice pick lobotomy okay lobotomies are basically cutting making lesions in parts of the brain right and whenever you damage a certain part of the brain that might be overactive it can stop seizures or it can stop you know violent mood swings or whatever else it is um 
But the ice pick lobotomy, quote unquote, there was this sterilized medical implementation, kind of looked like a screwdriver, right? That's that's the way people have described it. And what made this procedure so unique, uh, whenever Freeman developed and 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 honed this particular procedure, was that it could be done in a few minutes. You had this sterilized probe. You didn't have to cut open the patient. You could just go through the eye socket. That's the transorbital part, right? You're going through the eye in order to make lesions in the brain. And this procedure was done on thousands of people in America. Thousands of people, right? We didn't stop to think about the implications. And in fact, in fact, a lot of the messiness around this led to uh, the reputation of Freeman and associated people basically tanking, right? For good reason. But again, this is why we're studying medical ethics because whenever we see some sort of medical procedure that seems to be doing something very important, right? and, and certain people will say, you know, look, these, these lobotomies, they were one of the few accessible technologies that would help people in very severe circumstances. Fine, right? Fine. Uh, neuro, neurobiological sort of compounds that help people by, via medicine, they weren't really available for a really long time. And once they became available, obviously this stuff didn't happen as much. But we need to weigh the risks and the benefits. And we also need to be careful that we aren't just doing things on vulnerable populations Moreover, there were many instances where this technology, because it was so easy, right? I think NPR did a story on, on a particular guy who was looking, uh, looking for information on his own lobotomy uh, because he received one of these whenever he was a child. People would sometimes just do these things and sign their children up or whatever else because they were troublesome children, right? They weren't even people that had, had uh, procedures or, or had any sort of um, disorder that would have merited an extreme medical intervention like this, okay? That's something we need to watch out for. That's something we need to watch out for. Who's being treated for these things? Are there alternative methods? Uh, what's going on? What's the actual reason that people are doing this, right? Moreover, whenever physicians or scientists are asking to do research, it's usually pretty complicated. I think that most scientists and most physicians are actually motivated to help people out. They're motivated by beneficence, right? Actively doing good, or they're motivated by non-maleficence, avoiding doing bad. But we also have to take the virtue ethical considerations um, here, which are things like consider what kind of person would do these things. And we can't ignore ambition, we can't ignore financial gain. We need to be critical of that, right? I'm not telling us to be cynical necessarily. I'm telling us to be critical of people's motivations to really figure out what's going on and decide what's ethical in these cases. The lobotomy is one of the cases that has been infamous in recent history, and it's one that's fairly complicated. And I think that it is one where ambition and money uh, can be brought in. We also read about the case, right? Um, the physician who was a uh, physician, quote unquote, right? Who was implanting slices of goat testicle into men to solve, uh, to solve erectile dysfunction, right? Look, the history of medicine is, is, is really wild. It, and, and it didn't have a good reputation. Uh, Cooper, Professor Cooper Owens talks about this in, in her book, right? She talks about how at, at the, you know, in the 18 and 1900s, medicine wasn't exactly a respectable thing. Lots of lots of quacks, lots of people selling things, sell, selling weird cures, right? Medicine has advanced a lot, but whenever you get on the cutting edge where we don't understand the disease or where treatments aren't easy to come by, we also have to be very, very careful. And this is also what can lead to people being exploited whenever they're desperate for particular cures, okay? Now, I'm not saying... Uh, you know, that all traditional medicines or holistic medicines are bunk. But what I am saying is that, uh, you know, even someone like Steve Jobs, right, was taken advantage of by certain people because he had a disease that he was really worried about. 
So just as much as we have to consider the psychology of physicians and scientists, you know, they, they, they probably are well motivated, but we also have to consider finances and ambition just to make sure that that stuff is is up to par or up to, you know, up to the right moral standard. Similarly, we need to be aware that whenever we're dealing with patients who are ill, patients who are suffering, um, not only them, but their families and their communities, we need to think about the vulnerability, think about the anxiety, think about all of those things so that we can make proper decisions in these cases. Informed, voluntary consent. Informed, voluntary consent. That's why it's so crucial to make sure that we're taking the time to talk with people, to give them information, and we need to make sure that we aren't coercing them into something, but that it does seem that they want this procedure done, right? Okay, probably the most infamous uh, study in American history, and we've seen it, you know, in play today, after the, uh, you know, during the COVID pandemic and after some of the vaccines have been developed, is the Tuskegee syphilis experiment or the Tuskegee syphilis study. It happened here in America, you know? It started in 1932, but it ended in 1972. 40 years, 40 years that this was going on, okay? 40 years! I don't, I don't know when your parents were born, but, you know, 1972, they might have lived through part of this, right? This wasn't that long ago. It went on for 40 years. And this study especially violated the basic rule of human experimentation, which was informed voluntary consent, right? Uh, and, it, and it failed at pretty much every single level. There are certain people who try to contextualize this and make it better. But actually, the more you look into it, the more that it just looks really bad, in my opinion. And it's because information was actively withheld from people. You know, they were fudging information or maybe telling them the wrong thing to get them to participate in the first place. Uh, people knew sometimes that they could that they might be being exploited but physicians would intentionally tell them otherwise or participants wouldn't tell them otherwise so that they could recruit participants right that undermines the the, the information right it, it they aren't consenting into something you're lying to someone they aren't autonomous anymore okay and and moreover they were outright deceived about some of their treatments sometimes the things that they were given weren't weren't effective, right? And they were even prevented from seeking treatment at other places because the scientists wanted their result. They just wanted to see what would happen whenever syphilis ran its course in people. And we knew that it could lead to severe, severe brain damage that could eventually lead to your death, right? So what they were trying to do is just see what this you know, well-known disease would do to people whenever we actually really knew. And the, and the thing is, like, uh, they did this for 40 years, okay? And part of their preventing them from seeking treatment was that uh, there was no clinical or scientific use after the 1950s, okay? And, and this is 20 years into the study, or 20, and it went on for 20 more years after that, because penicillin and similar you know, derived treatments was found to be a safe, effective treatment for syphilis. The scientists and the physicians knew this, but the study kept going for 20 years after that knowledge, and they tried to actively prevent participants from actually going and receiving that particular study, right? And what's, what's really, I think, jarring to me is that this was only stopped after popular press got a hold of it and blew the story up because they had internal review boards that looked at these things and almost everyone, I think except for maybe one person in, in one of the reviews, decided to keep doing this experiment. They decided to keep doing this experiment, okay? First of all, it's questionable what knowledge they were getting in this particular case, where they were just looking for people that had syphilis and just seeing what it did to their bodies, okay, what, what good does that do? That's, that's already ethically and scientifically dubious. But on top of that, right, after there was an effective treatment, they didn't, 
they didn't make it available to them. They didn't make it available to them. Additionally, who were the people that were being studied? Tuskegee, Alabama. They were largely recruiting rural, impoverished black people. Okay? That should also have set up red flags. Now, I, I know, I, you know I'm, I, I'm not you know, trying to say that I'm not trying necessarily to judge people in the early 1900s by today's contemporary sensibilities. Even so, right? Even so. One particular demographic taking the brunt of this in a study where basically it's questionable as to any good is going to come out of this, but there are definite downsides to letting syphilis keep going forward. Moreover, syphilis is something that can be passed on, so there are public health considerations here as well. Basically, the Tuskegee syphilis study is just a monumental, monumental failure of, of any sort of ethical consideration, and it, it leads... To, to all sorts of all sorts of problems, which I'm, I'm sure that you've read about. But in a study about or, or in a lecture about medical experimentation and informed voluntary consent, we, we have to talk about this. We have to talk about this. But a, a, a lot of people pretend, you know, again, that it's just anomalous. Oh, there was just that one study. Look, it's it's not anomalous. It's not, right? And so Professor Cooper Owen, she wrote this book called Medical Bondage, right? And what she basically says is, you know, a lot of times whenever we look at the history of medicine, um, and especially something like gynecology, what we do is we find people, these central historical figures, right? In the case of gynecology, Dr. James Marion Sims as the father of American gynecology. And we think that. He went all around the country and even to Europe to, to talk about procedures that he had done. And look, these procedures were really important, right? They learned how to repair uh, fistulae, which are basically holes between the, the, the woman's reproductive system and maybe in the bladder, maybe into the digestive system. And and this could lead to all sorts of things. It could lead to infections, right? Because if, if feces is going into the uterus, that can provide lots of problems, can provide lots of pain, but it also leads to a lot of social ostracization because of the smell that can be emitted from, from those, those parts, right? It's a very sensitive thing, and, and he pioneered methods to treat this, okay? But here's the thing, and this is what uh, Deidre Cooper Owens is, is kind of talking about. At his hospital... He had the work of Anarcha, Betsy, Lucy, and nine other enslaved women and girls who contributed to the research, okay? We don't acknowledge that a lot of these experiments were done on slaves. Now, it's kind of talked about in the American literature, right? It, it, she, she talks about a lot of the, the journal articles where they don't necessarily, uh, they don't belie the fact, right? Um, but we don't think about that today. But she says, look, it's really important, though, not to construct, especially enslaved women or black women or any other people as just passive victims of everything. Now, they were, right? They were victims of really horrible stuff. Reports of not using anesthesia. Reports of saying that they were really good at enduring pain, but then also saying they had to be severely restrained in order to do the particular procedure. And, and it can't it can't be underemphasized that the procedures that are being done are being done on reproductive organs. Reproductive organs, y'all, are incredibly sensitive. Imagine not having proper anesthesia. Imagine just doing exploratory or experimental surgeries, right? And so, like this this weird thing where we don't acknowledge certain things, we don't acknowledge the contributions. Um, that's what Cooper Owens is trying to get over. But it's not just that they were subjects. It's that Anarka, Betsy, Lucy, and the other women, they became experts in this field. This was a nascent field. This was a field that was just developing. And these women, they were nurses in this hospital, and they probably knew more about gynecology than most doctors at the time. We don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. Why? Right? Why? Is it just that, you know, historical narratives are complex or is there some sort of social element 
that has to do with racism and sexism and all sorts of other stuff, socioeconomic things, that we don't talk about this. And this is what Cooper Owens is trying to get us to think about. But I think that she also shows how complex this is whenever she talks about this term that she uh, really tries to develop in this book and, and her other projects, which is she looks at black women, uh, especially, you know, bond women, women who are enslaved as medical super bodies, medical super bodies, because this represented a kind of strange contradiction in medicine where black women in the medical literature were often written about in these hyperbolic and I guess strong ways that gave them kind of superhuman status. They were fecund, right? So they could reproduce a lot, right? They were hypersexual. So they were unashamed. This is, she talks about how this, how this was uh, done with like black, uh, black women basically being operated on naked, right? And in front of anyone, or they would bring in lots of people to watch the procedure. Whereas if it were a white woman, even in the medical diagrams, the white woman was fully was clothed. She just had the part of part of herself, uh, basically her reproductive organs, right, um, unclothed, even allowed to wear shoes in one of the diagrams, right. The the poses and the delicacy with which they handled the white women was very different than the way that they handled black women, etc. So black women were treated as fecund, hypersexual, strong, resistant to pain, right, and. Part of the strength was that while they had these particular illnesses, and again, imagine the excruciating pain that you might be in with some of these, or the pain that might happen after you've been treated in these particular areas of your body, right? They were required to keep doing stuff, agricultural work, housework, whatever else it was, while they were ill or while they were recovering, okay? So... The medical literature kind of affirmed that there was a strength or a uniqueness to black women. However, it also still found them as inferior. And this is where the race science of the day kind of like, kind of went in. It's, it's strange. It's a strange sort of contradiction of medicine, where on the one hand, right, on the one hand, they were affirming that black women were indeed the same as white women right? Because they were using all of the experimentation on black women and slaves to pioneer medicine that they then went on to use on white women. If it weren't a strong analog, right, then the results wouldn't be able to be used. Does that make sense? Like black women, if they were really all that different from white women, you wouldn't be able to use the procedures that you developed on black women on the white, on, on the white patients, right? Yet, Yet, despite the fact that they were basically saying that, they still used the science to reinforce harmful stereotypes. Why, why would you talk about women being strong and fecund and hypersexual and, and all that sort of stuff? Well, that somehow justifies you then treating them differently, not believing their pain reports, not giving them as much anesthesia, not affording them human dignity or decency or covering them up whenever you're doing certain things. Not minding confidentiality. So a lot of the ideas that were perpetuated about black women were instrumental to exploiting them in the scientific and medical way. And again, this wasn't just one procedure. It wasn't just one doctor. It was multiple people, right? It was multiple people. And these women weren't volunteering for this. They were literally slaves and the owner was telling them they had to do this or doctors like James Sims would lease the women from their owners. Okay, it's it's a really messed up situation, but as messed up as it is, it also showed the ways in which black women resisted in the ways that they could and the ways in which they developed expertise and knowledge and passed it on to one another and found ways to treat one another despite all of the terrible things that the institution of slavery was doing to them, right? And I, I think that's what Cooper Owens is really trying to emphasize in this particular book. If it weren't for the contributions of black women, both as 
participants in these studies, subjects, right? But also as nurses, as experts, medical science wouldn't have advanced at the pace that it did. Now, maybe it would have advanced eventually, right? But not as well as it did. So we need to really be careful whenever we're studying the history of medicine that we're acknowledging the people who aren't often acknowledged. And, and this just happens with really uh, detailed historical work. All right. But this, you know, the Tuskegee study ending in the 1970s, this was back in the time of, that slavery was obviously legal in the U.S. This is still happening today, y'all. This is still happening today. And uh, this particular study is, is rather infamous. Dr. Johnson there with the yellow arrow, he's, he's the director of this particular institute. And Dr. Pape, he's a, a, from Haiti. He graduated from Wild Cornell Medical School and is, is a renowned doctor, right? But he also conducted these controversial HIV studies in Haiti, okay, in the 1990s and the 2000s. I think the New York Times wrote an article about this around 1999. They had around 15 years of documentation at that point. I don't know if these are still going on, but it wouldn't surprise me. Basically, physicians at Cornell and scientists and researchers at Cornell were wanting to study HIV. And so one of the ways that they wanted to do this was they they had a clinic in Haiti, and this clinic provided things like condoms and counseling and all sorts of other stuff for free to the citizens, right? You, you could do that no matter what. But they decided that they wanted to conduct a study on couples. And in particular, they wanted to study couples where one, one person was HIV positive and the other person was not. And they knew that there would be repeated exposure, basically through not using condoms uh, or whatever else, to HIV because the couple was sexually active, right? And what they were hoping to do was to find if there was some sort of natural immunity or natural resistance in a certain subpopulation of the group. But whenever they asked these people to participate in the study, they told them that they were just studying their blood, right? They didn't tell them what the structure of the experiment was, all right? Now, Dr. Pape and Dr. Johnson and other people are going to say, look, what we are doing is in that country, we're providing them a level of care that they don't really have access to. We're giving them condoms. We're giving them access to counselors. We're, we're you know, giving them blood screenings, etc., right? They have access to all of that stuff. Um... But what other ethicists have said is that that's not acceptable. Literally, your Cornell Medical School, you have a lot of money. Your researchers from America with a lot of money and you're in Haiti that you know doesn't have access to a lot of medical resources and doesn't have nearly as much money. And if you took the research protocols that you were abiding by in Haiti and tried to use them in America you would be deeply, deeply ridiculed. I mean, it probably wouldn't happen because the protocols are so bad, but you would be deeply, deeply ridiculed, right? Because in America, we have things like retrovirals that can help treat things like HIV and AIDS, okay? We have pre-exposure prophylaxis and similar types of medications. It's called PrEP. Right. So so if you happen to be someone who is sexually active and you interact with populate or, or you just interact with populations that have, uh, you know, uh, that are at risk for HIV at, a, at an elevated rate, you can just go to your physician and, and ask if you can get put on PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. And taking a simple drug like this can dramatically reduce your chances of contracting HIV. Right. That could be provided in cases like this, but it wasn't because they intentionally wanted to study what would happen naturally to these people. Sound familiar to any of the experiments that we've been talking about, right? This stuff is still happening today. And it's happening today, you know, uh, we talked about the Elliott studies and the, and the guinea pigging, but we're also, uh, we as Americans, we as people of the scientific and medical communities, right? We're conducting studies in impoverished regions of the world, third, third world countries, where we are not giving them the standard of care that we ourselves would find acceptable here. Okay, 
Dr. Pape and others are going to say, well, look, if we did that, we'd be spending a ton of money and uh, it's not clear that it's fair to everyone else, etc. But I, I don't know. Not many people find that argument appealing. I, I certainly don't, right? And again, 1990s, 2000s, I, I need to put this in here as well. So at the beginning of the COVID epidemic, right, there was Jean-Paul Murat and uh, Camille Locht, and they were talking about how to study the coronavirus at the beginning of the pandemic, right? And Mira said, uh, he said some, I think this is a quote, if I could be provocative, should we not do these studies, so the studies on COVID-19 in Africa, where there are no mass treatments or intensive care, a little bit like it's done, by the way, for certain aid studies or with prostitutes, we try things because we know they are highly exposed and they don't protect themselves. Kami Lacht said, uh, yeah, you're right. And by the way, we're in the process of thinking in parallel about a study in Africa, and that doesn't prevent us uh, in parallel from also thinking about studies in Europe or Australia. Now, these people, they, they later, they later apologize for these statements. But this is this is a contemporary example of exploiting populations just so that you can benefit what's going on, right? Just so that you can benefit the metal community or whatever else. You're willing to skirt considerations. You're not treating people the way that you would treat them in your home country, France, right? So, so I've given you, ex given you examples from America, from Sweden, from France, from Germany, all over the place, right? And the ways that we not only exploited our own citizens, and, and uh, Cooper Owens talks also about Irish immigrants and the ways that especially women immigrants were exploited. We're not just exploiting people within our own borders, but also people in other countries. This is an international concern, right? So Marsha Angel, who's, who's a, a physician, and she was the editor of a really you know, top-tier medical journal, she wrote an influential article on this. And, and she's talking especially about ethics, uh, the ethics of clinical research in the third world. So what we've been talking about with the, the Haitian study, what we talked about with you know, these COVID studies that these French doctors were recommending. And she basically said, look, I, I don't care, you know, how much medicine or science will benefit from things. What needs to be your priority is the well-being of the participants. The well-being of the participants is always, always more important than the research outcomes. That's what you have to prioritize. She's a physician. She's the editor of a journal, right? So she literally evaluates studies for publication and she's saying let go of the research if you can't also respect the well-being of the patients right the well-being of the patients takes priority moreover she says informed consent which i've been sort of repeating over and over again for the sake of the study that's too low a bar we need more than informed consent actually what we need to do is uphold things like the declaration of helsinki OK, and so there are many ethical codes that have been talked about. Right. There was things like the Nuremberg Code. There was the Belmont Report. There's the Declaration of Helsinki. There's a bunch of these other things that, that we could read in this particular class. We didn't we didn't read it because we read other things. Um, but one of the things that dec the Declaration uh, of Helsinki says is is basically that. And I think this is the last point on the slide. You have to uphold the highest ethical standards, okay? Against the study that Cornell is doing of, of HIV in Haiti, she's saying, okay, maybe in some sense you are providing medical care that is the standard for medical care in Haiti. But guess what? You are not acting on the behalf of organizations in Haiti. You are acting as members of research communities from Cornell in the United States, and you're using federal funding to do these types of things. You need to be upholding, therefore, 
the standards of your country. Cornell wouldn't let this happen to people in New York City at their medical campus. It wouldn't let, let it happen to students in, in the campus in Ithaca, New York, or whatever else. Why are you doing that in other countries? The Declaration of Helsinki says you're not just providing adequate care or the care that's appropriate for that particular country. You're providing the best available care by the highest ethical standards. You're not cutting corners here, right? And, and, and what she takes time to say is like, look, uh, a lot of you know, scientists and medical researchers are going to say that the double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trials, these are trials where participants don't know whether they're receiving the cure or the placebo, right? The thing that's, that doesn't have any clinical effect, right? They don't know whether they're getting the actual treatment or the placebo. The physicians and the researchers don't as well. It's double-blind. The participants don't know. The, the, the researchers don't know. So they can't manipulate the data, basically, right? She's saying, yeah, that is the gold standard in research, but look, if there's a disease and you have a drug that you know is at least a little bit effective and you're testing against a drug to see whether it's even more effective, the ethical thing to do there isn't to give a placebo in the new drug. The ethical thing to do there is to make sure that everyone is getting at least a little bit of a treatment, right? No one gets the placebo. We give them at least a minimally effective drug that we know works, and we compare it against the experimental one. And as an editor of a top-tier journal, she says, look, journals aren't draconian. We approve studies that are done in this way. Moreover, she says, profit shouldn't be the motive. Profit shouldn't be the motive, okay? Because one of the things that is said in defense of, for example, the Haitian HIV studies is that you would be spending many, many times, maybe even what the country spends on HIV and AIDS research on just doing one particular study if you provided the American or the best standard of care, right? And she says, yeah, so what, right? Profit shouldn't be the motivation. Your motivation as a member of the medical and the scientific community should be to promote the well-being of your patients or the well-being of the, part the studies, but the participants in the study. Sorry for that, right? Profit shouldn't be the motive. There are things that are more important than that. That's what she's saying. That's what she's trying to get us to see, okay? Now, one of the books that we could have read, and, and I, would have, I would have assigned this, but this, this semester has been super reading intensive is uh, Harriet Washing's, Washington's Medical Apartheid. It is a, you know, it's a really long study of all of the bad things that we've done to black people in America. From the t colonial times of America to contemporary days, right? I've given you a few things, but she, she talks about this as well. So after going through this history and touching on some of the lessons that we've already talked about, she gives us some tips for making sure that medical experiments are okay, right? One of them is we need to make sure that we're repairing IRBs. IRBs are institutional review boards. Institutional review boards are the boards of people that decide whether a study can continue to go forward, whether it's okay to start the study, you propose what you want to do, especially whenever it deals with human participants, right? And there's a board of people who either approves or rejects it or asks you to change certain aspects, right? And she says that basically the power of the IRB has been eroded in certain ways, and we need to make sure that that's not the case. One of the things is we just need to make sure that we're training board members. We need to make sure that they have the proper information that they need in order to assess experimental design and whether it's going to test or find the things that they think that it is. And in particular, we need to talk about conflicts of interest, right? Um, who's making money from this? Who's, who's getting notoriety from this? Is this influencing what's going on in these particular studies? Moreover, we have IRBs in universities, right? The University of Louisville has an IRB. Uh, hospitals have IRBs, right? But we need to make sure that they aren't overworked because if we're giving IRBs a ton of studies to look over, they don't have the time to read through everything and consider everything in detail. They're typically just trying to get through the cases, which might lead to an approv approval of things that shouldn't be approved. 
So we need to make sure that we're putting the IRBs in the proper uh, circumstances so that they can actually evaluate these studies in the right way. And she's going to say we need to include people in the IRBs who aren't just administrators or whatever else. We need to make sure that we have experts and experts from multiple fields. Okay, Science makes sense because if these are scientific studies, obviously we need scientific experts to tell us whether the research is going to do the things that they say that it's going to do. But the humanities are really important here too. We should probably have historians and ethicists there too. Why historians? Because historians, they know kind of what happens, right? They know the history of this. They know that many groups, many marginalized and vulnerable groups have been exploited in medical stuff. Why ethicists? Because hopefully ethicists would be able to bring the different theories that we've talked about to the fore, right? We can talk about consequentialism and whether uh, the results of the action are maximizing the good and minimizing the bad. We can talk about Kantian deontology and whether the dignity of the person is being respected and whether people are being allowed to be autonomous, right? We can talk about virtue ethics and care ethics, about whether the participants uh, are able to lead flourishing lives or whether it's improving their flourishing or the character of the people whenever they're going through this. What are the scientists motivated by? Are they motivated by profit or by ease, convenience, or are they motivated, motivated by rigor? by the well-being of the patients. They can apply the, the principles of biomedical ethics, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice, right? Ethicists can do these types of things. She's saying we need to have a diverse, disciplina disciplinarily diverse set of people on these review boards. Moreover, we should include lay people, normal people, uh, because if you can't explain the study to normal people, how are you going to explain it to participants? Informed voluntary consent. If you can't explain it to people on an IRB, there's no way that you can explain it to people, to your participants in a way that they're going to understand such that they can ethically consent into a study. So first of all, it should just be lay people. Second of all, it should be lay people of the group that you're trying to study. What would happen if there were an IRB composed of lay people from Alabama to try and get approval for the Tuskegee syphilis study or just to do a periodic review of how that study is going? Went on for four decades, y'all. Four decades, right? Chances are they would have thrown up red flags, right? That's what she's saying. We need to consult the groups that stand potentially to be at risk or to lose things, okay? So it's not just that we have an IRB. So ethicists, you know, a lot of people are gonna say, we know that we have to get approval. Harriet Washington, Marsha Angel, other people are saying, that's not good enough. Let's make sure that the IRBs are actually able to do their job. It's not good enough that we just have a committee. We need to make sure that they're trained, that they understand conflicts of interest, that they actually have time to do the reviews, that there's multiple types of experts on the committee, and that there's lay people, especially from the group that's being studied, right? So that's one thing. She gives a couple of others that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over. She should say, stop eroding consent, okay? All patients, all participants should have absolute control and access to information. If they say they want to be in the study or don't want to be in the study, we have to believe them. If they say that they want to withdraw from the study, they should be allowed, right? We should just take that as important. And in particular, we need to pay attention to the ex exceptions because there are exceptions. Soldiers sometimes aren't given consideration, okay? Unconscious uh, ER admits. So people who show up to the emergency room unconscious, they might be enrolled in a study, especially at university or research hospitals, okay? And third world subjects. Sometimes we don't explain things the way that we should. We've seen this as well in articles from this class, such as the uh, hysterectomies or, you know, the gynecological procedures that were happening, unwanted medical procedures that were happening, in detainment camps for immigrants in the United States today, right? Again, not just an anomalous thing. 
Not just an anomalous thing. What seemed to be the motive there? Lots of things, right? Could just be overt racism. Literally, you're sterilizing a group of people that political parties don't like. But it's also greed. They got paid per procedure, right? The, do the physicians got paid per procedure. The detention uh, facilities make money on these types of things, right? We can't be making, except making exceptions for these types of things. We need to take it as absolute, informed, voluntary consent, okay? How can they consent if you aren't even explaining the procedure in their own language or giving them an opportunity to ask questions? All right. Moreover, and this is like just the, the general thing, if there's no positive consent, either because they're refusing or they don't have a capacity to consent, you just don't enroll them in the studies. It's as easy as that. Two last things that she's going to say. There needs to be mandatory education of the participants. And she, she recommends via three classes. And she doesn't give this particular breakdown. But I think this would be a natural breakdown to, to hit all of the points that she talks about. First of all, participants need to be educated on how research is done. What happens in these research? Why are they using human participants? Uh, you know, what, what are the likely stages that they've done? So a lot of pharmaceuticals are likely tested on animals before they reach humans. There are different stages of human trials. Uh, there are different ways of collecting data, right? Tell, like, if you tell, if you tell just a layperson, hey, do you want to be part of a double-blind, randomized, uh, randomized trial? Uh, they're going to be like, I, what, right? And then you need to explain, well, what does it mean to hide? the hide whether the participants or the scientists know who's getting the treatment and who's not what is a placebo right what does it even mean to not receive a treatment uh why why would we do this why do we need a sample to be randomized or to be or maybe maybe even not randomized to be focused on a particular demographic they need to understand at least the basics they don't need to understand it so well that they can conduct their own experiments but they should understand a little bit so that they understand the terminology right Second, they need to be educated on their legal rights and moral responsibilities. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory, right? They should be comfortable with, uh, with understanding what recourse they have if they feel they're being taken advantage of or why stuff is being explained to them in certain ways. You need to empower them to be able to refuse or to be able to do stuff. So here, here's another example that I could have included. Uh, Vanderbilt, so where I got my PhD. It was sued by a group of women because they were injected with radioactive chemicals for a particular study and they weren't. They told that they weren't being informed with, with basically the dangers of that, okay? This is contemporary stuff. This is contemporary stuff and it's happening by all sorts of universities. And then lastly, Participants also need to be educated on the questions that they can ask and how to maximize their desired results. So participants, they might not know that they can ask certain questions. They might not even know what to ask. Uh, and, and moreover, they might not realize that there are things that they could do to help them to make sure that they're getting the best benefit from that particular research study. That's part of the education. Informed voluntary consent, right? And she's going to especially emphasize that we need a unified standard of research ethics, the highest level of care everywhere. So that's consistent with the Declaration of Helsinki, the Declaration of Helsinki, right? That says that we need to provide the highest level of care, not just the level of care on average for that particular country or whatever else it is, the highest level of care. And given that she's writing on African-Americans and African-descended Americans here in America, black Americans, right? Um, People in the African-American community, she says, should also be setting their own research agendas, getting active, making sure that they're, they're forming ideas on what they want to happen, that it's not just being decided by people from other communities, okay? Science and medicine, it often aspires toward objectivity, toward being disinterested, toward trying to let the facts and the treatments speak for what they are on their own terms, right? We don't think that science and medicine is just opinion. It's not just, you know, 
uh, arguing about taste or whatever, right? We think that there is some sort of rigor. But what I hope a lot of these examples have shown is that as objective as we hope it is, the objectivity is often undermined at the very least. Maybe it's not objective at all, but the undermine or the objectivity is undermined by many ulterior motives. Ambition, greed, racism, sexism, ableism, whatever else it is. And it doesn't just have to be so like so remember also the points about systemic racism. I can't remember that we talked about it in this class. The thing is at the level at which science and medicine is operating an institution the individual practitioners don't have to be using racial slurs uh they don't have to be of a particular racial background or whatever else it is in order to be perpetuating racist ideas that happens no doubt right but if you're working for a system that actively devalues people or doesn't empower people to do the right thing especially the participants if it if you're working for a system that exploits people or if you're working for a system that disadvantages certain populations or gives advantages disproportionately to other populations, just by being part of the system, you can be part of the problem. OK, this is why uh, scholars like Ibram Kendi, I meant to put his book up here. I just forgot to put him in the slides. But Ibram Kendi says it's not good enough just to not be racist. Right. It's not good enough to just not use racial slurs or whatever else. Uh, you have to be anti-racist because in a country like America, where especially black people were enslaved for centuries before we were even a country or, you know, at least a century before we were a country and there's where there's centuries of exploitation, right? The system has been set up in such a way that it disadvantages certain populations. And if we just aren't racist, if we just go with the flow, or if we just hide behind the law and say, do what's already in the rules, we do not do the work of anti-racism, which is to ask whether the laws and the system and medicine and science and all of this stuff, whether it's actually a good set of laws or a good set of guidelines in the first place, okay? It's not good enough just to follow the rules. We have to ask whether the rules are just, whether the rules are ethical. It's not good enough just to go along with the common sensibilities of people. We need to subject the sensibilities of people to ethical scrutiny because it used to be not only legal, but also maybe even seen as an okay thing to exploit people, right? Think about all of the justifications that Deidre Cooper Owens talks about with respect to the ways that they talked about black slaves, women slaves, but black slaves just generally, and Irish immigrants. And educated people said these types of things and the effects that that had, right? So we need to actively scrutinize all of this stuff to make sure that we're doing what we should be doing. Again, not good enough to just go with the go with the flow. Not good enough to rely on you just being a decent person. Uh, because a great many moral atrocities throughout history have been committed by decent people. And they're committed by decent people because decent people just go along. They don't do the work of being anti-racist or anti-injustice, right? Hopefully that's what this class is doing. Hopefully that's what this class is doing. So I want to end this particular presentation with the principles of bioethics, because if you take nothing else from my class, I want you to have these four principles. These four principles are crucial, okay? Um, and in particular, I want to study these four principles because I think they're extremely relevant here because we have a conflict of two principles here. The utility of research or knowledge, right? So the good that we're doing with the research or the bad that we're avoiding, utility being the unity of those two things, and the autonomy of the participants. Dr. Pape in the Haitian study, the doctors in the Tuskegee syphilis study, the doctors in, in any of the stuff that we've talked about, whenever you ask them why they do what they do, they don't just say because. They offer ethical arguments. 
They use ethical reasons, and their ethical reasons are it will benefit the scientific community. It will benefit everyone with uh, more medical knowledge. They offer beneficence and non-maleficence as their own reasons, but they sort of skirt around the fact or they ignore the fact that they're denying the autonomy of the participants. They're not allowing people the opportunity to provide informed voluntary consent, right? So what do the principles say? Autonomy. We want voluntary informed consent. That should be self-explanatory. I've sort of repeated that over and over again. If we want to uphold autonomy, we need to make sure that the participants are actually able to refuse. They're able to understand what's going on, right? That's, that's what we do. Justice. Uh, we're talking about the distribution of benefits and burdens. So the benefits in these cases obviously is the treatment or the medicines or the knowledge. Uh, and the burdens are access to the treatments or the risks of the research. So access, maybe they're given placebo studies. Maybe in the Tuskegee study, they're not even told about penicillin or given access to it, right? And they're certainly bearing the risks. They're certainly bearing the risks. So, for example, Cooper Owens talks a lot about the women who died of procedures or of complications. And it could have been as a procedure. It could have been them being forced to go back to work in the homes or in the fields after, after they had these experimental procedures. Uh, but we need to make sure that the benefits and the burdens are, are being distributed justly. The principle of non-maleficence, basically meaning avoiding doing bad, avoiding harm is basically scientific and medical pressure to stop a disease. So whenever people appeal to non-maleficence, usually they're saying that the science or the medicine is helping to stop the disease or it's building the medical community to be able to avoid a lot of pain or complications or whatever else. And beneficence, uh, oh yeah, so I forgot that I put this in, but also avoiding exploitation. That's something that we should also put in, in non-maleficence. Because look, if a doctor is saying, think about all of the people that we could treat by conducting these experiments, even if we fudge something like autonomy. If, if your ethical principle is literally to avoid bad, avoid the bad of the disease or whatever else, you need to include within that the bad of exploiting people and especially exploiting people in any sort of systematic way. Because what history has shown is that Systematic exploitation has horrible, far-ranging effects, not just on a particular study, but on an entire population of people. And now, for example, society doesn't trust medicine or science for a lot of good reasons. And part of that, part of the way that we could have avoided that is by really paying attention to exploitation and its effects, right? And then the last principle is beneficence actively doing good. The act of good here, right, is hope to find cures and provide them. So this is a complex thing, right? It's a complex thing. And most of the people that we've talked about today are going to say autonomy in the case of medical research with human participants. Autonomy has to be absolute. If there's not informed voluntary consent, then what you're doing is unethical, probably also illegal, right? But definitely unethical. Um, justice is also the really important thing, making sure that we aren't exploiting or taking advantage of vulnerable populations. The non-maleficence and the beneficence are there. Yes, the research can help people uh, avoid pain. Yes, uh, it can actively contribute to medical knowledge and, and give people hope. But those things need to be weighed against considerations of exploitation and justice and violating people's autonomy, right? And so I hope that the readings from the, for the articles that we did for the group work, the books that we've talked about, and then the extra stuff that I inc included in this lecture from stuff that I wish we had time to read, but I'm not going to give you more reading than I've given you because I feel like I've given you a lot. Um, hopefully... Hopefully this is impressing the, the importance of informed voluntary consent and just the importance of us being active, critical thinkers that are questioning whether what we're doing is right. That is questioning 
Um, despite the fact that we're decent people, whether we're actually behaving like decent people or doing what future generations will consider is decent as well, right? Because the history of medicine is full of a lot of educated, well-intentioned people doing really monstrous things because they aren't taking the time to consider what they're doing, right? Or they're finding some sort of scientific or medical way to justify what they probably know is wrong and what they wouldn't accept if it were done on themselves. Hopefully, now that we're, you know, getting close to the end of the semester, the principles and the lessons that we've learned so far is going to give us a little bit of a basis to resist those types of things. So thank you so much for paying attention. Thank you uh, for, for letting me talk about those really difficult ideas. If you have questions, feel free to email me. Um, thanks. I'll see y'all next time.